uh, want to thank uh, all of you for coming out this morning, and um, let me take a photo or two to remember this. Smile, come on, you can do that. You can write, maybe you could code a smile, I don't know. So, um, yeah, so I'm Jeff Pulver. I, I've been around uh, developers most of my life. I, I started writing code when I was, uh, I think I first hacked a si computer system when I was 12 years old. Um, but there's things that actually happen that sometimes are more important than writing good code. Sometimes uh, you don't appreciate that till you get older. And I, while well, I really can't see into the audience, I imagine there's some people here that may have gone through what I've been through, but um, life is funny sometimes. I uh, spent my life challenging the status quo. Arguably, I am a misfit. I don't fit in. Uh, how many people here have their own startups or part of startups? How many people here have been fired from a job at least once? Oh, come on, really? Um, you know, when, you, when you're a teenager and you realize you don't want to work for somebody but want to work for yourself, you have this sense of independence. And I'm very fortunate to come from a world where I was able to, when I was in high school, have three startups. And um, although I didn't appreciate that there were startups until much later in my life, I just did what I thought was fun. But over time, it was my curiosity to do things that brought success uh, in the sense that uh, if any of you have been involved in voice over IP in the last 20 years, my claim to fame is that I actually helped popularize that technology. I know there's some people here that have been to my Vaughn conferences years ago. There's some, some people in this room that must have used FaceTime or Skype or Snapchat or any type of voice or video service and not have to pay for it. You're welcome. I had a vision 13 years ago that in the United States, uh, phone companies would get jealous about the, the ability of broadband to be disruptive. And so I went to Washington and actually asked for a regulatory clarity that voice communication on the broadband internet not to be regulated as phone services. And a year later, they granted what's called the pulver order, which until not that long ago was my greatest achievement in life other than having two wonderful kids. But then um, in 2012, something happened. Uh, along the way, I should mention, and I didn't bring slides because I didn't really want to make this a talk about how to get rid of some weight because that's just a piece of my story. But um, during my 20s to my 40s, I put on arguably, I don't know, 40, uh, 55, 60, 65 kilo. So I, I got success in different ways, but healthy wasn't one of them. Then in 2012, I woke up one day and I realized something had to change, and that change was me. And um, without getting into too many details, I figured out how to outsource over 55 kilo, more than 125 pounds. And I call it outsourcing because um, if you uh, lose something, it sometimes finds you. But if you outsource, you don't give a shit. It's like, it's, it's out, it's gone, it's good. So in fact, from, two, from the summer 2012 to 2013, I did just that. I actually figured out how to do that. I, I engineered it. I, I purchased 41 books on health, wellness, fitness, and food. I found a lot of conflict in nutrition, so I became my own nutritionist. I did a lot of research and realized, yes, everybody is a snowflake. Everyone's DNA is different. It won't work for me. It may not work for you. But the overall concept of taking ownership of what you eat and taking ownership to be who you want to be and learning that changed me. And I was very happy that I discovered on Facebook crowdsource motivation that the more I shared what I was doing with strangers and friends, the more response I got from people. And that turned out to be a good TED talk that I gave once, and uh, that was fun, but it's not why I'm here today. But after I got rid of this weight, one of my co-founders and my dear friend Jacob Nir David from uh, Israel, he, my co-founder in Zula, is a marathon runner. And while I was obsessed with getting 10,000 steps a day, because I wear a band and I have to get my 10,000 steps, you know, it took me three hours, not efficient. He's a marathon runner, he can do it in an hour. So during 2014, I figured out how to get an hour, how to get 10,000 steps in an hour. Jog, run, you can do it. So the least athletic person in my life, me, somehow figured out how to do that, and that was cool. And then I was in Tel Aviv on October 28th, 2014, about a year ago. I uh, entered my first ever um, 10K. Any, any guys run, jog, right? So I'd never been in any kind of organized race, and I was told that this was a fun race to do because everybody wins by entering. Frankly, getting my cardiologist to sign off that I was healthy enough to be in this race was a win. That was the win to, that was my win, but 
I signed off, and every kilometer there's a band, there's a DJ, and people just have fun. So I was looking forward to that. But as life would have it, seven hours before the race, while I was about to, right before I was about to order lunch on the beach in Tel Aviv, I had a seizure. And uh, it's a kind of seizure where, to this date, nobody knows what the cause was. Uh, I'm told that everyone in the world is allowed to have one seizure, and 50% of those people will never have another. In my particular case, by sitting still in a chair uh, and seizing for five minutes, I had enough physical strength to dislocate my right shoulder, tear, uh, uh, fracture two bones in my shoulder, and tear seven muscles off my bone. That landed me two nights in the hospital in Tel Aviv, and when I got back to New York at the hospital for special surgery, I had five nights there, and they reconstructed my shoulder. What I learned about in the past year is about how to breathe. What I learned about was life. What I learned about was how to be in my own flow and embrace it. I, I run a conference every once in a while, the 140 conference, and the tagline is exploring the state of now. And I used to always use a hashtag, live life now. But until you're lying in a hospital bed, thinking back to the year that you had that's, not, that's now over, about all the things you didn't do, you don't always really appreciate living because you're just not there. Because you know, how many people are sitting here right now on devices and not listening? Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> but if you go to a meeting and, and you're in that meeting or you're with someone that you care about and you're thinking about who you just were or you're focusing on where you're gonna be, you're not where you are. And it, sometimes it takes a major life moment for you to understand that all you ever have are moments. The memories that you have are those moments that get weaved together. And if you're lucky to be alive, then be alive. Don't worry about being distracted. Don't worry about what you didn't do. Don't worry about what you're going to do. Be there for yourself. For me, I, it was a little humbling because I had a decent life. I was very happy with where I was. I went to Tel Aviv, after all, to run in a race to celebrate my health. And I come home from the hospital and I can't button my shirt. I couldn't tie my shoes. As a grown adult, I actually moved into my mother's house because I couldn't take care of myself. Not only could I not take care of myself, how many people here have had shoulder surgery, shoulder work? Some of you, some, some of you know this. So it turns out, by the way, that, that your shoulder is an amazing piece of engineering. The human shoulder is the most amazing piece of engineering that you just don't appreciate how magical it is until it hurts, until you hurt yourself, and then you can't do something or you can't exercise the way you used to. Well, let me tell you, it turns out one of the things that if you hurt your shoulder, you can't sleep in a bed. So I came back to my mother's house, I took over her living room, and for about four months, I, left, I slept in a chair. Not because I wanted to, but because I couldn't, I couldn't, I was in pain. And the nice thing about pain, by the way, is that while you have it and it's excruciating, you don't remember it. And um, I was so scared about getting um, addicted to painkillers that I, I did a bad job about pain management. I was sort of on the other side of the pain sometimes, and I understand what it's like to stay ahead of the pain. But that whole idea, basically, of being in that moment, right, and being very humble because now I'm in my mom's house, can't take care of myself, and of course, my father passed away about 17 years ago when one of my sisters moved in with my mom. And I'm sorry, guys, if you're going to see this somewhere, but um, I'm sitting on my mother's couch, and my sister and my mother are talking about me as if I'm not there. It was a little hard. It's like being a teenager all over again, except I'm not a teenager, I don't think. Um, that was hard. What was also hard was staying on top of people that were so caring. You see, I was planning a conference while right around the time that I, of, the, of the surgery, of the surgery, of the accident. And so I sent out an email on my mailing list to people telling them that I had to postpone this conference because I was injured. I received, no exaggeration, over 700 emails from people or more that were just so nice, so kind, so considerate. But every time somebody sent me an email, as I'm trying to reply, if I felt a little bit of pain, I basically had to hit the next because I couldn't handle it, I couldn't focus. And it got to a point where I was hitting next, 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 and I shut everything down. What I discovered, what I learned was mindfulness. What I learned is that if I need to be there for me, I have to actually give myself a chance to heal. I get, have to give myself a chance to breathe. I have to give myself a chance to be and not beat myself up for all the things I didn't do in 2014. For all the people that I didn't say I love, for all the people I didn't give a hug to. See, it turns out I'm a hugaholic. It's my, what I do, I like to share hugs. And I spent seven months this year without being able to hug, and it really hurt. So when I finally got my strength back at the end of May and was able to hug, 
that felt good. And um, I was able to move back into my own place in June, but I'm still not really where I used to be. I used to travel everywhere all over the place all the time. This is my only my first, second international trip this year. What I discovered, though, while I was um, incapacitated in some ways, was the only place I actually found true love was on Instagram. Any people here on Instagram? Now, you know, for different reasons, I happen to have been active on Twitter and Facebook for a long time, but I discovered a lot of darkness. But my friends on Instagram, like myself, for whatever reason, we have extra time on these days, I only see golden moments of people's lives. The magical moments is what I see, and it's really special. I, I, I'm, uh, it turns out that I'm neither passionate nor obsessive about anything, but I'm passionately obsessive about everything. And, and, and these days I've got into photography, because uh, when I, I happen to be a left-handed person, and part of my therapy to get my right shoulder going was to take photos with my right arm, which sounds silly, but you know, when you're walking around with a sling for 10 weeks and then you're trying to do physical therapy, I, I just phys finished physical therapy two weeks ago. I did t three days a week for 10 months. And, um, but it was the photography that got me back into it. And so through Instagram, I'm able to curate golden moments of my day. And whether it's uh, landscapes, I've recently gotten into astrophotography, photographing the stars. And uh, I had an, when I, I was in uh, Tel Aviv for the first time this year in September, and I, had, I was fortunate to go to a crater. It's called Mitzpe Ramon. And when I looked up in this crater, how many people here look up and see the Milky Way on a regular basis? Oh, cool. So you understand that when you look up to the sky and you can see it, you actually can see the stars of your ancestors. That um, for every, anyone, by the way, who don't know what I'm talking about, it took me 52 years to get there. But you know, to look up to the sky and to see the heavens and the cosmos is pretty amazing. And I realize I'm not the first or last person to ever say this, but sometimes you have to walk into darkness to find light. In my case, when I walked into, when I went into the crater in Spay Ramon, I looked up and I saw this amazing galactic center of the Milky Way. I was like, oh my God, this is fucking cool. I became obsessed. So I, I spent September and October traveling around the world to different locations to photograph the galactic center of the Milky Way as if it's my new hobby. Got this little camera, turns out there's been a revolution in technology. While I was sleeping, small compact cameras like this, if you know how to do the manual settings, give you amazing photos, amazing opportunities. And then I was thinking about, about this uh, galactic center of the Milky Way, and what I realized is until the first industrial revolution, until we had light bulbs everywhere, anyone from the time of whenever until about 150 years ago, when they looked up to the sky, they saw this amazing sight every night, assuming it's a clear night, every night. Then the Industrial Revolution came forward and it actually started to bring darkness. Because as our skies got polluted, our ability to see got dimmed. And unless you went to the, went to the dark places, or dark places with dark skies, you couldn't see. And, um, and then in the last 150 years, so and basically from scripture through Shakespeare till mid-1850s, any kind of literature, if there was references to the heavens, I'm pretty sure it was a very literal reference. For the last 150 plus years, if you see people making references to the cosmos or heavens, I think it's more of a, a simile or metaphor. People most of the time are not seeing it, they may be feeling it, but they're not looking at it. And uh, I, I think there's an opportunity for people to actually to look up and to appreciate life. And whether it's to look up and see the stars or just to look up. You know, my kids, when they were eight years old, they'd walk around the streets of New York with their Game Boys. And I used to say, don't look down at your device, look at the street and cross because you get hit by a car. Those Game Boys have been replaced with iPhones. But how often do you see people that you're talking to looking down all the time? Maybe they have eye contact, but very few of us are looking up. But it's the looking up that gives you the perspective to do all sorts of things. In my particular case, I look, to, I look up to life. What I've discovered is to let myself be. And I'm not trying to be terribly philosophical here, but from a practical perspective, if you're dead, it's hard to hear me right now. But if you're alive, and also if you're beating yourself up because you're not doing something, you're not achieving a goal, well, fuck that. See, if you're having a bad day, I believe you can close your eyes, count to five, and start your day again. You don't have to wait till midnight. I used to actually go home and go to sleep to start my day again. I used to actually try to reboot myself like a computer and think that I have to just hit restart. But now I can just count to five and do it again. And I, and I believe that if you're not, if you find yourself in a situation where things are not working out, my biggest um, competitor in life is inertia. My biggest fear 
is not doing the things which I put off that I can't do again. Um, when I was, um, when, when my, uh, my dad passed away when he was uh, about 17 years ago, I remember seeing my grandfather being at my grandfather's house. And there was a photograph of my dad having his photograph taken. And, you know, Twitter was around back in the, those days, which would have been, I guess, the 1940s. Maybe my dad would have tweeted what it was like to um, have his photo taken for, by, by the photographer. Maybe the photographer would have tweeted what, my da- what it was like to photograph my dad. The mistake I made was not asking my grandfather what he thought about that photo. I missed the opportunity to have context to things because the person I asked, wanted to talk to is no longer with us. And that kind of gave me insight that, you know, we have what we have. There's no more, there's no less. It's where you are that matters. And so, you know, when you're working on projects, I can tell you it's very easy to beat yourself up. You are sometimes your own worst enemy. You want more out of you than your bosses. You want more out of you than anyone ever wants. And sometimes you can't get there. Sometimes you surprise yourself on the positive. But there are people that, me included, that if I, get, if I attack myself, I am defenseless. And it takes forever to bring myself up. I, I miss my dad a lot because while he forced me to think, he also got me out of depression. But when you're driving, when you're creative, when you're intuitive, sometimes you make mistakes and you deal with inertia. And uh, life can be funny like that. But if you learn to embrace what you do and not apologize for your success and allow yourself to find what you want to do, you can do almost anything. I mean, I magically, for some reason, ended up um, helping to promote voice over IP. I don't have a background in telecom. I I co-founded a telecommunications company called Vonage. I'm telling you, I know nothing about telecom, really. But my passion was ham radio. Anyone here know anyone ever use amateur radio? So the thing is, what I discovered growing up as a kid, my first social network was ham radio. When I was nine years old, uh, I was pretty lonely as a kid. When I was uh, nine years old, one day my dad told me to call my uncle up, his brother, to have him show me something. I never did that. But one day I'm home from school. I go to my, my uncle takes me to his office, shows me a factory tour. So my uncle was in the, uh, my uncle was in the uh, test equipment business for cable TV. He was very successful in the day. And um, I didn't care at all. Because I figured everyone's nice to my uncle since they all work for him. So they have to be nice to me. But my uncle brought me to a small room in his office, which was his office. He had this little box. He turns on this box. There were these radio tubes. They lit up. And then in a very cryptic way, my uncle said these words, which I'll never forget, which I'll explain what they mean in a second. But what my uncle said was, CQ, CQ, this is K2QQM calling CQ. And he repeated it for about a minute, let go of his microphone. And for about an hour, I was mesmerized as the world was waiting to talk to my uncle. The letter C, the letter Q, means seek you. It's an abbreviation for Morse code. Do anyone here remember ICQ? So that was, that was invented by some lonely ham radio operators who are also fairly innovative. Um, and so to say CQ means I'm seeking you like I'm seeking a person. So what I discovered that day was that my uncle had the cure for loneliness. All I needed to do was take that radio off his desk in his office and put it in my bedroom, and I could forever never be alone. And, but the catch was, he's a licensed amateur radio operator. So when I was nine years old, I had to teach myself college level physics, Morse code at the time, and the rules and regulations to be an amateur radio operator. So I failed a lot. I learned about failing. But when I was 12 and a half, I finally got my license to communicate, and I'm very happy I haven't shut up since. Because once I had the opportunity to connect with other people, I discovered social media. My media was the, the radio. Because you could tune a radio dial, you could know people's personalities, you could listen, you didn't have to say anything. But if you're a 13-year-old kid, nobody wants to talk to you because you're not interesting. So you learn to listen, you learn to share, you connect, learn to connect, you learn to engage. And it was my passion for amateur radio that saved my life. Because when I was working, I used to have a job on Wall Street, one of the few times I actually had a job. And uh, I was working on Wall Street from 93 to 96. And I was responsible for new technology in a company that was responsible for keeping things the way they were. I was the VP of uh, Information Technology at Cantor Fitzgerald Securities. And uh, I discovered while I was doing my day job the ability to talk on the internet. And what I discovered was voice was an application, not a service. And that one day I believed that we'd all be able to talk to each other without the need for phone companies. 
During 95, I launched the world's first internet telephony network called Free World Dial-Up. Did anyone here ever use Free World Dial-Up? Maybe, some, maybe one, oh, okay. Well, it was sort of like Napster, but for phones. But in, but in an internet of 16 million people, we, we went viral. And very fortunately, I'm very grateful that that cost me my job. I got fired. Free World Dial-Up caused me to get fired, which ironically, uh, unfortunately for a lot of my friends, it wasn't so good for them, because the company I worked for lost 700 people on 9-11. I worked in the World Trade Center for Tanner Fitzgerald, and about 400 of those 700 people were people I dealt with on a regular basis, and so I forever, for never will forget them. But I'm very happy that I got fired, and when people lose their job, I always tell them getting fired can save your life, because it saved my life. And it's my passion to communicate that got me involved in Twitter and my curiosity, because I think as much as voice over IP was the radio uh, or the telephony of the internet, I thought at the time in, in 2006 that Twitter was the radio of the internet, because you could listen just like on radio, and then you can connect and engage. And, um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how successful you are. I promise you, in this audience, there's some people here in a year or two, if not already, you'll be millionaires, multimillionaires. Money will not matter. But if you're not able to breathe, no money in the world is going to bring you to a point where, you, where anything matters. And to the extent that you're actually healthy enough to hear what I'm saying, I, I urge all of you to take a moment to actually do a deep breathe. Do something that matters to you. If there's someone you love that doesn't know that you love them, call them, tell them, tell, express yourself. Talk to people while they're alive so that you don't have the burden of not communicating with people when you can't. And try not to live in a world where you have any regrets. That if you do good for yourself, I promise you'll do good for others. But it takes a moment in time in your very fucking busy life to do nothing and to have the strength to stand up and say, I matter. That you matter just as much as anyone you work for. You matter just as much as anyone that loves you. Sometimes the trouble is you give so much of yourself that you don't know how to take something for you. And it took me my entire life to find that balance. And uh, I try to breathe all the time. I try to be proper for myself. I love to give to others. But I learn to also shut things down sometimes and just relax. Because I don't want to have another seizure. They don't know what caused mine, which is good because when you're 52 years old, if you have a seizure, sometimes it's a brain tumor. So I'm happy they don't know why but it could have been low electrolytes, it could have been uh, um, dehydration, could have been that I was obsessive about working out seven days a week and not telling people about that, and maybe I just was just pushing myself a little bit too far. But whatever the case is, I'm now nicer to myself a little bit. Uh, I'm still, I still find my passions, but I, I also urge all of you to trust, try to be there for you. I know life gets really busy, and you have to be in so many places at the same time, but don't have a heart attack, don't, don't have a seizure, don't have something horrible happen to yourself for you to realize that you could have a great life if all you did was take care of yourself. My dad died of cancer at 61. I hope to outlive my father. My grandfather made it to 94. I hope to get there. But more importantly, as much as I want to be there for my kids, I want to be there for me too. And uh, it just takes a mindset, which uh, you know, I hope that you will find the time to, to put in a do loop for yourself. Take care for you. Thank you very much.